Okay. Welcome, everybody. Let's get started. You reached Talking Biopolitics. We're glad you're here. And I'm Marcy Darnowski, the Executive Director at the Center for Genetics and Society. Today, we're going to be talking with Reagan Brashear about her new documentary, Fixed. She's going to be interviewed by Gina Maranto. Before we get started, I want to uh, make just a few announcements. Um, let's see. Uh, the first thing I would like to do is tell you about um, a little bit about our Talking Biopolitics series. We've had a wonderful um, bunch of conversations and uh, we've been enjoying them very much. Hope you have been too. There's one more coming up this year and on, that's on November 14th at this time, 11 o'clock Pacific time, 2 o'clock East Coast time. We'll be talking with Alexander Ministern and Corey Johnson. Um, Alex is a medical historian who's written about the history of eugenics, especially in California here. And Corey Johnson is an investigative reporter who has just uh, published an expose about some really horrifying sterilization abuse going on now in California prisons. So you can sign up at our website. You can actually click on uh, the RSVP link that you see right there as well. And we've had a number of uh, conversations that already this year that are available online on the Center for Genetics and Society website. We've talked with Miriam Zoll about her book, Cracked Open, about the fertility industry, with George Estreich about the shape of the eye, his memoir of uh, his uh, parenting of his daughter, Laura, who has Down syndrome. Ruha Benjamin's book, People Science, is about the politics of stem cell research. Donna Dickinson's book, Me Medicine versus We Medicine, about the um, meaning of personalized or precision medicine for public health and our understandings of our own health. And we've also uh, talked uh, last year with Bill McKibben about his book, Enough, Staying Human in an Engineered Age, and with Dorothy Roberts about her book, Fatal Invention, about the use and misuse of racial categories in uh, medical research and other, other uh, aspects of society, and with Harriet Washington about her book, Deadly Monopolies. So all those conversations are available on the Center for Genetics and Society website. You can uh, watch them, you can listen to them there. And just to uh, give some kind of context for the series, Talking Biopolitics is part of our efforts to instigate conversations and thinking and policy outreach about the whole range of issues um, having to do with human biopolitics. So um, we hope you'll watch and listen, we hope you'll forward them to your colleagues. Okay, a few words of logistics about today's event. Um, I will first introduce Reagan Bashir and Gina Maranto. Then we're going to see a brief trailer of uh, Reagan's film, Fixed. And after that, um, Gina has some questions for Reagan, and then we'll bring your questions and comments into the mix as well. Now you can ask your questions or make your comments at any time by typing them into the Q&A box that you see on your screen. And um, Gina will uh, see those and get to those um, in due time. So please do type in your questions and comments there. Let's see, just some housekeeping stuff. Um, whether you're joining us by computer or by phone, your line, the participants' lines will all be muted. And that is just to ensure that we have good audio quality for everybody. That's um, that's participating in the webinar. Only the presenters' lines um, are unmuted. And so that's why we're asking you to submit your questions and comments by typing them in the Q&A box there. If you're having any computer issues, uh, delay, out of sync audio and visual, the most common reason for that is that you've got other applications running on your computer. So it, you can improve the quality by shutting all those down. And if you run into any technical uh, issues that you can't solve, you can call Charles at 510-665-7760, extension 301 uh, or 316, I guess. Either one of those will work. 
And I want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, and that's how we will later make it available to everyone online on the Center for Genetics and Society website. Okay, just a few words about the Center for Genetics and Society. Uh, we work for responsible uses and effective societal governance of human genetic and reproductive technologies. And um, the new biopolitics that we're aiming to build uh, is grounded in the values of social justice, human rights, ecological integrity, the common good, and democratic governance. We do this work um, in several different ways. We do focus a lot of effort on our media and communications. And um, just this week, uh, we have uh, Osagi, uh, Oba, Osagi Obasaki uh, having published um, a commentary about life patents at the Boston Review and Pete Shanks about Google versus death at Huffington Post. Uh, we've been in the news commenting on 23andMe's patent on a kind of uh, computerized designer baby drop-down menu application. And uh, we regularly appear in the media and publish um, our newsletter. We're on Twitter and Facebook and you can Join us there, and we hope you will. We also spend a lot of effort at building a network of advocates, scholars, policymakers, artists, filmmakers, others to address the new biopolitics. And we intervene selectively uh, in policy controversies at the state, national, and international levels. So that's who we are. Um, we have a lot of resources to offer that we hope you'll take advantage of. And we hope you'll keep in touch with us that way and that you'll also support us with your contributions of all kinds. And we'll say a bit more about that later. But now let me introduce our presenters. So now can I ask Gina and Reagan to sh please share your webcams with us. And they're just gonna click. Good, great. Okay, welcome, both of you. Hey, welcome. So let me introduce you briefly and then turn things over to you. Reagan Bashir is the producer and director of Fixed. She's been working on labor, race, youth, LGBTQ, and disability issues for over 20 years. And she's done this through not only documentary film, but also union organizing, community forums, and grassroots activism. She's now based here in uh, the Bay Area in Oakland, California. She's a co-founder of Making Change Media, which is an organization that produces videos for nonprofits and labor unions, as well as independent long-form documentaries such as FIX. So welcome, Reagan. We're so happy to have you here. Okay, and Gina is Gina Maranto mm -hmm. is director of Ecosystem Science and Policy, and also the coordinator of the Environmental Science and Policy Program at the University of Miami's Leonard and Jane Abbas Center. She's a prize-winning science writer, and she's written on a range of science topics, in including human biotech issues. And she's published in Discover, The Atlantic Monthly, Scientific American, The New York Times, and many other. And she's the author of a prescient book um, called Quest for Perfection, The Drive to Breed Better Human Beings. Welcome, Gina. To both of you for being with us today. And um, I'm now going to turn it over to the two of you. Okay. Great. Um, I think Charles is going to show a trailer. It's a great pleasure to be um, talking with you today, Reagan. Um, it also feels a little bit, I normally live tweet these, so it's funny to be uh, actually in front of the camera and, and um, uh, on stage with you. So I think uh, Charles um, is going to start the trailer after um, you give a, a little intro, right, uh, Ray? Sure. Yeah, just to say that the trailer we're, we're going to watch is about six and a half minutes, and it just, it, you know, gives a, it's a teaser to, that shows the different issues that the film works on and, or touches on. And so hope, hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Who wants, Who wants to have, to have um, a jetpack to fly around? No? Who wants to have um, special robot legs that make you go faster? 
No, no, you don't want that. Only Zachary wants that. Only Zachary wants that. Who wants us? Want us? You want that? Yeah. Yeah. Who would want um, another eye? Oh yeah, I want. I want three eyes on the back of my head, but they're covered in hair. What do you think humans need? What do you think humans need to improve them? A female marine veteran has become the world's first true bionic woman. We're already part artificial, aren't we? If there were a drug that would make you smarter, would you take it's it? Is the quest for a perfect baby morally wrong? The Sprinter is running with prosthetic legs faster than most people in the world. It will redefine the field. We're used to a certain amount of artificiality, but this is taking it to a full yeah, the, 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 It's happening now. What does it mean when you can augment the mind, if you can improve memory? What does it mean if you could augment the body? In the future, emerging genetic technologies coupled with assisted reproductive technologies could give us the capacity to design enhanced children, which causes concerns about creating genetic casts and superhumans. There have been so many advances, even in the past few years, that I think people are aware how more aware at least, how quickly the technologies are moving. Us humans, especially us baby boomers, are really going to want augmentation pretty soon. As we start to decay, we're going to be demanding more and more augmentation. I'd like to have a better memory, maybe with memory chips or something. I probably want to be taller so I can play for the NBA. I just turned 50, so memory is like sort of an issue. I'm happy who I am. I actually don't need anything. I mean, if I could fly, maybe it would be okay. Am I disabled? It depends which definition we use. Of course I'm a disabled person. Do I see myself as an impaired person? No. I'm just who I am. There's all kind of dynamics which goes around this obsession with ability and competitiveness and that the only way to get respect is if you show you're superior to someone else. Ableism is our obsession with certain abilities and the accompanying negative treatment of people who don't have these kind of abilities. Human enhancement is no different than human. Everything from brain implants to spinal cord injury, rehab, to cell phones to gaming. There, there is no difference between them. What if this kind of what collaboration with a machine kind of was flexible machine. enough to allow the user to do whatever they want with it? You, you want to make a device that has and a sophisticated enough collaboration that that human will make it in their own way, in their own image. In their own way, in their own image. My artificial limbs are now part of my, my body, are now part of my identity now. Body. What I'd like to see is the death of normal. What I'd like to see is the What is normal, normal to you? What is normal? I thought I was normal before my I injury. Thought I, was normal I certainly before still feel injury. normal today. I, still feel normal I really don't today. understand the desire really for our health care technologies. We don't have basic health care. We don't have not only in this country but globally. Mm -hmm. Not only in this country, but globally. Preventable diseases are like number one preventables globally. Like Talk about misplaced priorities. Talk about misplaced priorities. It is like this huge irony that the research money that goes into emerging technologies as opposed to wheelchairs that are bought. That demonstrates financial priorities for the healthcare system. Financial priorities for the healthcare Wheelchairs are amazing. And well, that's really precious, and at the same time, it's a machine. Really time, you know, I'm, I'm subject to its. You know, I'm, I'm subject to its. Um, frailties. You know, like any machine. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it makes me feel pretty vulnerable. Where are the hand controls? Daddy, here are the hand controls. controls. All right. People should think right. of disability as People another of human experience. Another All right, ready? Experience. That embodies All right, ready? qualities that embodies of human qualities of adaptability. Human adaptability. That are common. To all that people, whether they have a specific disability or not, they have a specific disability and the experiences of people with disabilities have lessons for the population at large. Technologies that help bring people up to normal are used to help people go beyond normal. Often when I talk about implants to people, I say that's too icky. 
No one would do that willingly. No one would have a cochlear implant if they weren't deaf, if they didn't need it. No one would have a visual implant if they didn't need it. And I say to them, Botox. People will do anything to their bodies for, for, for enhancement, social enhancement. If you force me to see myself as deficient and you want me to enhance myself to your level, then I of course will say no. I go further and then you are deficient because I outdo you. I mean, why would I want to have legs which only get me to your level? Every line we draw will be, will be, will be transgressed in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And, and we are going to see more and more augmentations, alterations of our body as the technologies develop. These genetic technologies assume that human variation along the spectrum of ability should be eliminated. We have these technological developments. They're not inevitable, but they do have a lot of momentum behind them. And so we at this point in human history, we're at this moment where we have to, where it's our responsibility where it's to, our really responsibility to really, and really make decisions. Well, Wow, that, that clip uh, touches on so many themes uh, from the documentary, uh, which brings us so many voices. Um, talking about normality, utopianism, uh, ableism, adaptability, augmentation, uh, and hearing from such a range of different people, from Patty Byrne, the, the disability activist, to Gregor Wolbring, the biochemist, um, to John Hockenberry, the journalist. So, Maybe we can begin before we delve into a greater depth about the documentary to um, maybe we can talk about how you came to this project, Reagan, because you, you spent many years working on issues around labor, uh, LGBTQ rights. Um, you served as a co-producer of the documentary The Grove about the AIDS memorial site in San Francisco. So maybe you could tell us about what led you to think about the issues in, in Fixed. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here in this forum. It's really an honor. Um, and as far as this film, I was actually working as a union organizer for the clerical workers at the University of California and just happened to be in San Francisco on a weekend and was walking down the street near the women's building and, and stumbled upon a um, genetic engineering conference that was open to the public. So I just kind of wandered in and and lo and behold, there's Gregor Walbring giving the keynote address. And I just was captivated by what he was talking about and how these new technologies that, you know, he's talking about bionic legs that, you know, one day should be able to give, you know, him the ability to run faster and jump higher than, you know, some quote unquote normal bodied, you know, able bodied people could do. And, and, and that was sort of interesting enough to be like, wow, I want to say and listen to more of what he has to say. And it was just really out of my normal realm of, you know, what I've been working on. And, um, but in his breakout session, he was talking about being invited to the, um, this NSF sponsored conference around um, converging technologies for improving human performance and where they were bringing together this researchers and policymakers and scholars to, to really think collectively about how can we make more productive workers and you know what applications might the military have for this and, and you know the idea of cyborg warriors and enhancing our capabilities to be you know better fighters and that kind of thing and and that really rang an alarm bell for me because I just I had studied a little bit of eugenics in my undergrad work and and it just sounded sort of eerie that we were just sort of doing this in the plain light of day and I took so it, it grabbed me and I, I kept in touch with Gregor and um, the co-facilitator was from the ETC group um, Jim Thomas and, and actually I met with him later that week I think Gregor had to go back to Calgary where he lives and um, and was really pursuing this idea around nanotechnology was was also they had another workshop about sort of where nanotech was going and how we might you know the cautions and risks and dangers that might lie there and and um, and so that just was like on my mind but I you know went back to 
work as an, an organizer and um, and sorry for the condensed this. I um, for the union I actually had um, made a documentary about um, the first or the, at that point the biggest strike in UC history, which was the clericals and the lecturers went out in 2002. And um, and that's sort of like you know backstory is just my interest in documentary as a form and and um, and that experience really just sealed the deal in terms of um, me. Well, so the the strike very shortly was just a two you know it was a two day strike. The demands you know we actually weren't met. The university didn't you know give great raises that year and the different issues you know. But what and then the, you know the actual. Daily News sort of dropped the story, and it just seemed like it could have been like, oh, that was didn't go anywhere. But, but the story I was seeing in front of me as being an organizer was the amazing solidarity and relationship building between different sectors of workers on that campus and local people and students, and and those relationships really grew and you know into future actions and you know just so anyway, it was a great opportunity to tell that story through video and and. Uh, and then showing it in the local labor film festival, you know, to an audience of mostly, you know, the clerical workers and the lecturers, and sort of seeing the, the pride of having their story told, and um, in this respectful way, that it just it made me realize, like, wow, this is such a powerful medium, and and something I want to continue um, working with. Plus the fact that I was an introvert and am an introvert, and the, being behind a camera felt much more my thing than being in, behind a bullhorn in front of rallies and that sort of a thing. So. Right. So, so you met Gregor, um, and then you mentioned that you began sort of thinking about nanotech. Um, so you, you had kind of this uh, impulse to do documentary, but it was leading you towards nanotech. So, so what happened? You, you met with Jim Thomas. You had coffee with him. You, this was what, about uh, 2004 or so? so? It would have been about 2004. I just, you know, I started researching and actually went and filmed at several nanotechnology conferences and just people's lectures and just sort of trying to understand and and really what it, it came to what I came to was realizing that my real interest in this is is the social issues around emerging technologies and really it was what Gregor was talking about was like really the interesting nugget in there as as someone who's been an activist most of my life and, and concerned with social justice and um, and also just there's the also the economics of like I knew I wasn't able to make and really interested in making sort of an informational discovery channel let us you know teach about you know these things and I just wouldn't have had the funding or access to do that and so it all you know worked out that it, I just really wanted to hone in on the social underlying social issues around ableism and how is it playing out in these emerging technologies and not so feeling like you, you could you talk a little bit about the title of the film which is which is a really interesting title fixed which has several meanings and and um, you seem to be sort of working with this notion of the social model of disability versus the the medical model of disability sure yeah I mean really what I was examining is sort of you know if we're going to understand enhancement and this idea of enhancement and being Coming better than you know normal. Um, I feel like it's really important to understand disability and how we hold disability in our culture, and um, and and so that sort of it was like sort of turning this on its head to be like, well, what is what might be playing into motivating the the types of research that's happening, and and um, and it did seem to revolve around this idea of fixing. So um, the title I felt like was appropriate because it, I wanted to really hold that up and like let's look at what does it mean to fix something and, and what's the problem you know and and, and so it, it's sort of um, basically asking a point to like let's really examine these notions and um, and sorry I'm losing my train of thought but fix just yeah, the, 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 the tie in. if something needs fixing it must be broken right right so right it, it, basically it points to so this question around, you know, where is disability located? Is it is it in the body? And that's where you get these different frameworks of understanding disability. And and that was just really such an interesting journey because I, I think I really began with sort of my own perspective 
of an, you know, I, I was in a car accident in 97 and sort of had a, I've been dealing with fibromyalgia and chronic pain ever since. And it's, it's, I have sort of my own personal experience of disability and, um, and it, it, really it, it gave you some insights into, um, into the ways in which bodies are categorized and the ways that people make um, assumptions about disability and about other people's bodies, about their own bodies. Yes, yeah, I mean, it, it really brought home this idea of like, okay, the social model versus the medical model is, is like, you know, like when I was in the settlement after this car accident was, you know, the insurance company was talking about, oh, there's pain and suffering. We're going to, you know, give you the settlement. And, and I was like, well, you know, what's the difference? And then after I learned, you know, it's like, oh, okay, pain is what I am feeling, but suffering is all the other ramifications of it's, you know, finding employment, finding, you know, you know, not just in my own case, but in many people's cases, it's just, you know, getting access to education, housing, basic fundamental things. There's so much social stigma around having a disability in our society that it's, there's all this other, like, suffering that comes from that. And, and that is, I think, where at the heart of when people are talking about a social model, it's like, okay, if you really want to make people's lives better, we need to think about what's, what's really going to benefit the most amount of people. And I think that's at the heart of, like, you know, what direction are we putting our priorities and our research dollars and and attention basically like what is the the social project here and, and not to say it's got to be black or white and that there's not some middle ground or some way but I, I think that's really what the the film is trying to do is to bring these two sort of camps together to talk because I feel like there is and that was sort of one of the things that was a, a you know I really learned in the process of making it was just really seeing like this is not at all for me at least, a film I, that I feel like has a lot of answers. My, my point is to really raise the questions and, and be like, wow, they have a really good point, so do they. And, you know, like, that's what would happen if they talked to each other. And um, that's what I'm hoping the use, you know, will go out into the world and generate those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that comes across throughout the film is the level of respect that you have for everybody who's involved. Um, and, and also the way in which you didn't make assumptions as a filmmaker, um, whereas I, I think, you know, that's the sort of prevailing, um, the, the notion of normalcy and the societal assumption that um, ableism is preferable. And, and I think Gregory talks a great deal about that, about the way in which ableism is embedded in these technologies that in many cases, in some cases, say Hugh Herr, who's the young the climber who, as a young man, had the 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 um, uh, um, rock climbing frostbite and had to have his legs amputated. And he he's really uh, he's at MIT now. He's designing these body interfaces, and um, his voice he basically thinks, you know, I'm making these things for people, and they should want them. Uh, Gregor's point of view is, no, it's a choice, and I choose. Uh, not to give in to the sort of demands of the ableist world. Yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, I think Hugh would, would say, of course, he wants people to have a choice, too. And, you know, if Gregor chooses to, to not use these technologies, that should be his right. I think the slippery slope or the, the difficult area or the gray zone is, is when is how things become sort of normal culture, like, well, if everybody's, you know, using these prosthetic legs, the people that choose to crawl are really stigmatized. Or, and it happens in every little area. You know, you see sort of, um, you know, I mean, we have a little bit about cosmetic surgery in the film and, and looking at sort of the trajectory of, you know, plastic surgery was, you know, first for therapeutic uses, you know, burn victims, and, and, and then it became, it's become more of a commercial industry that it's, it's you know, everyone could have, opt to change their, their bodies and ways, and, and what's interesting there is it's not like, you know, we have this, this belief in there that's like, oh, well, it's personal choice, it's individual choice, but the reality is, like, people are choosing the same nose, the same, you know, body, you know, and it's, it, that those are the parts that I think are really hard to, there's no way to control that. And I think the only way is really to hold it up and say, this is, look at this, this is what's happening here. And, 
Um, yeah. It's kind of interesting. You, you, you talked a little bit when we spoke before about the way in which shows the people who appeared in the film, and and um, maybe you can tell a little bit about that story and and sort of how your thinking changed as the process went along. Yeah. Well, I I had. You know, the, the media coverage and films that I had seen previous that dealt with disability and technology really seemed to pit, it, used to, it seemed to be like people with disabilities were the sort of passive recipients of this, you know, this grand technology that was going to, you know, change their lives. And, and, and it seemed like a sort of a monolithic voice of like gratitude and, you know, and it just, and I felt like I was much more interested in not to knock those technologies and the amazing things that they can do for people, but I know that it's not, you know, like there's a whole range of opinions about what's useful, what what people want. And, and so I wanted to show that in the film. And I also just wanted the experts to be primarily people with disabilities, because I feel like these are the people that have the most at stake here. Like they're gonna, you know, be um, interacting with these emerging texts a little bit more closely than, you know, than others. And, um, but I also didn't want to, like, at first I was like, well, should it just be people with disabilities? And, and, and then that felt like a weird fetishizing. And I was like, no, it really just needs to be a conversation. But I really did want to locate most of the airtime with these, you know, individuals that represent a range of opinions exactly. within the disability community. So. And you have that experience. Well, I think what's, what's really effective about the film, you know, in addition to this diversity of voices and the respect that you show for all the different perspectives, is the, the way that you really, at, at the end, frame the issues in a social justice lens. So um, I, I was really left with the message that, you know, that these technologies are only accessible to certain people. And, and it, there's that line that I think it's Patty Byrne, the disability activist, who says, you know, um, I would like just somebody to be able to fix my wheelchair. You know, I mean, um, her access is, is limited uh, by her life circumstances. And, um, you know, the, the, there are race and class and gender barriers to, to, to getting to these technologies. And, and I think the other thing is the issue of the utopianism. Do you, do you think that you know, did you come away at the end by thinking that the scientists and, bio and bioengineers who are doing this work are really promising more than they can deliver as a kind of salesmanship way to sell the technology? Sure, I think I think in some t and definitely in some cases, and and certainly communities that have sort of formed around them, I think really promise so much, I mean, like in the transhumanist community, I think that they, they really do believe that this, this sort of utopian vision is, is within our reach. And, and, um, and there's, a, you know, differences of opinions within that sort of group of folks, not just, you know, it really does vary. And there are people that have very, you know, care about social issues as well. And, and um, but I do think that, you know, I mean, and in part, so the, the, title, the rest of the title of the film is, you know, fixed the science slash fiction of human enhancement. And it's looking at sort of that relationship between science and science fiction. And, and, and I think there's an interesting loop, right, where what we imagine can often lead into, you know, the technologies we develop. But again, it's sort of like whose imagination is getting privileged and, and you know, what are the worlds that are being imagined and, and led towards and, and how do we make sure that that's not that everybody's included in that conversation and um, and just every step of the way like involve people with disabilities, people of different races and classes and you know just like it needs to be a broad spectrum and and I think that's where in my opinion it's really interesting to see examples of people doing that trying to figure out like the Center for Nanotechnology in society at ASU is trying to figure out what does meaningful public engagement look like, you know, and, and CGS is trying to do that. And, you know, and, um, and there's a great program when I was I actually finished editing the film at ASU this spring and, um, and was asked to attend this day conference for this great group called APAC that's the Alliance for Person Centered Accessible Technology, I think. And, you know, that's their whole focus is really how do we involve just, just, you know, people with disabilities from the get-go, ideally recruiting them to be the scientists that are 
you know, participating in developing new technologies for new assistive technologies. Um, so, yeah. Well, I think you've done a tremendous job, Reagan, with this film and have contributed uh, so greatly to, to this conversation. And I, I hope that the film gets loads of attention uh, and, and, uh, and really does spark a, a lot of conversation. So I think we're, we've we just about wound up our time with, with this segment, and I think that um, Marcy will be taking it over, and then we can um, work through some Q&A. Have I got that correctly? Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Okay, there. Oh, Gina, you, you should come back too. I, um, but thank you. Oh. Thank you for that. Okay, right. so we're just going to actually be taking a little break here um, in the conversation. And then for everyone who's joined us, please do type in your questions and comments, and we will. Um, come back to those in just a minute. Um, but in this little break, I wanted to tell you about some uh, resources that are available about FIXED and also see some CGS resources. So first, um, the links that you see up here on the screen are all live, and we'll also be sending you all these links in a follow-up email, so you'll have them in your inbox. But we do want to let you know that um, uh, Reagan has a great um, website up about FIXED, and she's uh, says that it's actually going to be uh, an improved version of it coming very shortly. And there are several events coming up that we wanted to draw your attention to where FIX will be screened. One is the United Nations Association Film Festival in Palo Alto. Whoops. We'll come back to the, that in a moment. There we go. Okay. And that's on October 18th. And then on December 5th, there's going to be a wonderful event at the Ed Roberts campus um, of UC Berkeley. It's right at the Berkeley BART station, at the, sorry, Ashby BART station, for those of you who haven't been there. It's a wonderful facility, and it's going to be a wonderful event. Um, Fixed is going to be screened. Reagan will be there. Um, some of the other people in the film, including me, I'll be there. And I think it's going to be a, a really wonderful event. And you know, one I see that we forgot to put here um, on the slide, but we'll include in the email, is that FIXED uh, will be screened in connection with an event at San Francisco State University on November 1st. That's an all-day symposium um, called Future, Past, Eugenics, Disability, and Brave New Worlds. And we're um, almost a month away, but we've actually filled up the capacity of the venue so far. So we have a waiting list for the symposium. But in the evening, um, Fixed will be screened, Reagan will be there, and we can accommodate more people for that. So that's November 1st at San Francisco State University. And uh, again, we'll include all that information um, in, in the email, in the follow-up email we send to you after, after this webinar. Okay, we also wanted to just mention that on the Center for Genetics and Society website, we have um, several collections of commentaries and news articles about the topics that, that, fixed that FIXED focuses on and touches on. So we've got a whole collection on disability and human biotechnologies. We've got a whole collection about eugenics, which hasn't come up so far in this conversation, but may in the Q&A or q we're going to have in a moment. And um, we have a whole section also about um, enhancement and transhumanism, the idea that we should be putting all of our resources into these enhancement technologies. And again, want to remind you that there is one more Talking Biopolitics conversation coming up this year with Corey Johnson and Alex Stern. And that one is going to focus on uh, past and unfortunately current abuse of sterilization in, here in California, on November, and that's on November 14th. And here, uh, just to give you some links and to remind you, there are a lot of ways you can stay involved. We would really value your contributions to help us in our efforts to build a new biopolitics. Any amount is very, very welcome. And we have a, a web, website with many, many resources that we refresh constantly. 
We have a blog on which we publish our own commentaries, CGS uh, staff, CGS fellows, uh, regular blog contributors, including Gina has written some wonderful um, articles for our blog. Those are all compiled in an every other week newsletter and those, uh, the newsletter Biopolitical Views and News also includes a roundup of the news that's um, been in outlets around the world really over the past two weeks. You can follow CGS on Twitter, you can join us on Facebook and Google Plus, and we hope you'll do at least some of those things to, to stay in touch with us. Okay, so now um, let's go back to Gina and Reagan and bring your questions and comments into the conversation. And we've got some coming in, but please again notice that you have a Q&A box and you can um, type your questions and comments there and Gina and Reagan will be able to see them. So thank you very much. Okay, Gina and Reagan, we'll bring you back now. You can start your webcams. Great. Okay. Reagan? Mm, yes. There she comes. And I'm going to sign off now. There we go. Okay, great. Um, we have a, an interesting question. I can't read the whole thing, unfortunately, because I can't figure out how to expand the section. But um, the question is, how could the public K-12 and university education systems be changed in order to enhance the knowledge of um, of future bioengineers, policymakers, uh, and others. In other words, uh, you know, what what can we do in terms of education? To I think I see the the rest of the question. Um, it says about social justice issues involved in human enhancement. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's um, well, I I think that. Well, hopefully, you know, the film will hopefully, you know, contribute to those conversations. But I, I think it seems like more and more science and society classes and departments are, are taking off and, and these types of questions are, are fundamental to them. So I'm, I'm really hopeful. Um, and also on the high school level, not, I don't know, you know, like eighth grade and younger, um, but I think it certainly could be incorporated into the curriculum. Um, I was had the honor of, of um, showing a rough cut of fixed at a, um, a medical high school in Antioch um, with this fabulous teacher, Stacy Wickware, um, who's co-teaching a year-long medical ethics class, which was like, I was totally surprised that this exists, and I feel like the, her curriculum could, should and could be, you know, shared, you know, broadly and, and um, yeah, I just I think it is happening. It's just um, yeah, it's just just starting, and hopefully this momentum will keep going. That'll be great. Um, a, a question sort of related to that: um, How has the film been received so far? Um, uh, E.g., in the Kickstarter campaign and the sneak previews and reactions to rough cuts sent to the trailer. And I know you've gotten already some response responses from uh, at least one of the people in the film, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, overall, it's been amazing. We've, we've had um, a pretty amazing um, sort of preview period of, of showing the work in progress. And, um, you know, for instance, we, I was flown to Lisbon, Portugal, this, this spring to be a part of the, uh, the kickoff, public kickoff event at the National Science Museum there, um, Ciencia Viva. Um, the, the European uh, Union has created a, a three-year commission on neuroenhancement, neuroenhancement responsible research and innovation. It's the NERI project, and so they wanted to have a public kickoff about this idea of human enhancement, and so they invited the film, and and um, we had a lovely panel after with you know some of their leading scientists and and people that are involved in the NERI project, and and I could have asked for a warmer, you know, first screening, you know, it was just wonderful. Um, and it seemed like people were really excited to teach with it, you know. And, and similarly, when I showed a rough cut at Terrytown, one of the Terrytown meetings, um, that was what was so thrilling to me, was to have, be able to share, share it with so many educators and, and see them light up and be like, oh, I can't wait to use it for this class or this class. And, and the disciplines were, you know, across the board. And so, um, 
so that, yeah, I'm trying to think. And then the Kickstarter, yeah, we did two years ago, we did, we wouldn't have been able to finish without this, um, this platform called Kickstarter, which is a way that you can, you know, put out there that you're a creative project and ask the larger community to, to donate to support it from, you know, $5 to, you know, on up. And, and we were able to raise close to $30,000 in 37 days, which, you know, I've worked long and hard before, but I never worked that long. Long and hard. You know, I don't think I slept very much in those 37 days, but um, but it did allow us to continue, and um, it actually also was such an amazing community builder that rather than just wrapping up what we had there, we ended up shooting a lot more. So it did extend our timeline, but it, it's made for I think a much stronger film. Um, I, I, I there's a, another question, but I wanted to we didn't touch at all about the incredible uh, material in there that the dance. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the themes of the dance in, in the film because um, those are some incredible troops that, that you that you filmed. Yes, yes. I I was so excited once I sort of had this idea and I started putting it out there to these different um, what they call integrated dance companies, which is they feature disabled and non disabled dancers. And and people were really excited to be a part of it and, and it just sort of snowballed into this wonderful collaboration where, you know, we've got footage from all over the world, um, from South Africa, from the UK, um, several companies around the US, and and, and the, the idea of it for me was really as a sort of a, what is it, right brain intervention, surprise the audience to, to really think about bodies differently, and, and there's so much there talking, you know, that it, just some incredible passages in there. Yeah. Uh, the women with the legs walking. Yeah. The, so legs like, and arms. Right. That's Lisa Bufano, who does beautiful work with these sort of Victorian shaped stilts. And um, and then there's, you know, Sue Austin is the woman that's in the wheelchair that's underwater that opens yeah. the... I didn't want to. I didn't want to do that. That was a spoiler. That's one of the most incredible images <laughs> I've ever seen in film. It was both surreal and deeply disquieting. Yeah, yeah. But, but also for me, that was. It was a, such an up, like a uplifting, like like I love her that piece because she is totally subverting our ideas around disability and what what someone in a wheelchair should be able to do and. And like making us really turning it all upside down and looking at it, just opening our minds in this new way. And and then in terms of like enhancement, like she's she's repurposing this technology, this sort of technology that's been with us for a long time, and, and created a way to go scuba diving with it, you know. And, and um, so it's just I mean you could like go on about that. And and just it was such a joy to connect with her and 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 feel her excitement to be a part of Fixed. And um, yeah, so. We're actually no, it, it, working it definitely on bring, having the art in there, the dance um, uh, with this highly cerebral material um, and, and deeply ethically challenging, and then having the dance was so affirmative of, of, of difference and of what we do with our, our different bodies. And I, um, I have to admit that it, I also, I just am such a, I love to dance and I. That was one of the things with my accident when I couldn't dance for a few years. I felt like I couldn't dance. So then realized, like, wait a minute, I can still move. I can still, you know, maybe I can't, you know, fly around like I used to, you know, but like I can, like, just, it was such an inspirational thing for me as, you know, someone with a hidden disability to, to witness these amazing works of art that these people are doing. Just, I just feel like it's just deeply enriching and, and like, like such a yes, you know, and, and, yeah. um, <laughs> And also just such a counter to the dominant paradigm about disability, like you just, you just, so, yeah. Yes, so there's a question about that dominant paradigm and, and sort of the historical um, uh, roots. Uh, and the question is, given that people with disabilities uh, were so frequently targeted by eugenics programs in the past, and you mentioned your initial response to some of that um, Technology when you walked by the conference with Gregor uh, sort of evoked your eugenics um, history classes, but um, given that history um, of sterilization and worse, did the topic of eugenics come up 
um, who are extensively as you were making the film and, and since um, I know that there you know are some uh, oblique mentions to it and and I think Gregor mentions it directly once but sort of you know, stuff that wound up on the cutting room floor was there further sort of discourse around that yes um, yes there was and, and I did um, at one point think I was going to go into more depth. There is a section in it that sort of, you know, Patty Byrne explains sort of briefly the history of the eugenic movement in the U.S. and it's cut with sort of, you know, images from that era and then it ends up, you know, with the dance montage, you know, sort of just sort of that gets at the, the heart emotionally of that, you know, the sort of the pain and, and anger and all of, you know, the pent up feelings that people have about, you know, what happened and what is happening, you know, and, and um, it, 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 it was definitely something we debated about, like, how much weight in the larger piece should it hold, and, and I think we, I think it just didn't feel right to kind of build out, like, it, like the rhythm of the film, it felt like that, that is, a, it's a, a healthy nod in that direction that will hopefully be an opening for people to dig deeper, but it, it just wasn't like, becoming a film about eugenics, it was um, right. sort of holding that in conversation with all the other pieces and um, that I think is important to do and, and, you know, it's just important to continue to hold that history so that where we go forward, it doesn't, we're not recreating the, the past. Indeed. Um, I, I, I think, too, the other sort of piece to, to the film that um, was your, your people on the street interviews. And um, so, how, how did you come up with that sort of idea? I mean, Hockenberry begins the the clip uh, doing that kind of thing, asking the little kids, you know, what would you? But you went around all over the place and asked people. Yeah. And got some very interesting answers. Yeah, it was really it was really fun, and I, I think the idea was to just to also try to lighten up, uh, you know, what's otherwise pretty heavy and talk heavy, you know, and, and add some humor, and but also really touch at that core like the imagination like our imagination and what we what we desire and sort of showing that and, and sort of the wide world of like what people could imagine and then to think about wow well, what is actually happening along those lines and um so that's sort of like the science slash fiction piece like just kind of weaving that in and um that's i mean that was basically the the ideas there and that was, you know, it's funny when in Hockenberry in that opening scene, he goes on, it's not in the film, but he actually goes on to say, well, you know, what I think we need is, is better teeth, you know. <laughs> and, and lately I lost a tooth recently and I was like reminded of that. I was like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> you know, like, we, we need better teeth, you know. So, um, well, it, it reminds me at, at the end, um, I, I, was, I was left, uh, there was a, a great... Um, fairy tale that I was exposed to when I was very young, and it's about a man, a stranger, who comes to a village, and, and he says, you know, I can take away everybody's problems, uh, and everybody says, oh, great, good, and he strings up a clothesline, and he says, okay, bring, bring me all your problems, and, you know, somebody brings their crutch, and somebody brings their adventures, and Everybody, somebody brings their glasses, and every everybody brings their ailments or their 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 disabilities, um, because we all have them at the end of the day. Um, and they hang them on the line. And he says, "Okay, now uh, pick which one you want." Everybody kind of looks around and they walk and they take their own problem back, right? Same. And I think, you know, the film left me. Um, uh, you also have some other footage in there. There's also just very deeply touching of just people on the street, people with canes, people with walkers, um, you know, people with glasses, people with hearing aids, people who are poor, um, and it it it's such a deeply humane film at, at certain points. It, um, it 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 leaves us realizing that. We're all we're all flawed. We we you know as Joni Mitchell said, our 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 uh, our perfection will always be denied, and and you know I think the thing is that that um, we we didn't really go there, but there there are some passages in the film where these 
these transhumanist sort of notions of, of what we can be um, begin to sound deeply unethical. You, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. in, in that they don't recognize the reality of, of our situation. Um, I think James Cashel says at one point, you know, you, you think the update on your computer is bad, uh, at, you know, when it fails. What about when it, when it, when it fails on a soft motherboard that's, you know, wired, hardwired into your brain? Right, right. Yeah, I think he, he, he does raise those, those really important issues of like, hey, let's not get carried away in the utopian, you know, vision of perfection. Like, it's, it's, we're going to still have the same issues that we, we deal with today are going to be, you know, continuing. And, and also, you know, I think both Sylvia Yi and, and Dominika Bednarska, you know, stress in the film that this belief that, like, one, that we're, we're all, we can all become disabled at any time, you know, we're all sort of dancing around this category of disability, and especially as we age, you know, it, it, it's, it's more likely to happen, and, and so I guess they just sort of voice their perspective of, like, believing that we're never going to solve all these, you know, problems, it's never going to be, um, and so what's more important is to, like, look at the society that we can create and that will embrace the diversity of humans. I think we have time, uh, Reagan, for one last question, and here's one from our participant. Um, as someone uh, who spent several years working on a regulatory issues related to technologies beyond the bioethics report, I am wondering, in your view, are there any new specific legal regulatory issues emerging from your, your work? Well, um, in other words, you, when you, what, do you, did you see anything that just made you say, uh, this needs to be regulated, somebody needs to examine this, and somebody needs to put the brake on? Well, certainly that's, that's like the, I think the hot button issue in the film that touches on that is around prenatal screening and genetic engineering and sort of like, where are we going to, how are we going to regulate these emerging technologies in those areas? And, um, and that I think is is probably the most you know immediate like we we need to figure this out and, and figure out what our how we're gonna you know these into our world and, and um but in terms of the other other ones I think um I mean it's it's certainly around there's a lot of work around just access and, and, and including people with disabilities at the table and sort of, you know, and there's all these different examples of ways that, that are happening that are, I think, really positive and, and you know, but I, I don't have any other sort of clear examples. Right. Yeah. Well, Reagan, it, it's been really fascinating and thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your vision. Um, this film is it's really, as I said, contributed tremendously to this conversation, and I, I hope that lots and lots of people will pay heed. Um, Thank you so much. It's been wonderful thanks. to share with you guys. <laughs> okay, this is Marcy, and I just want to thank you both. Um, let me see if I can bring myself back on. This was a really interesting conversation, and um, I thank both of you. Um, Reagan, it's just been wonderful over the last years to see this film coming to fruition. It's so exciting to see it getting out in public now. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. And again, this interview, this conversation will be posted on the CGS website and along with the other Talking Biopolitics conversations. And we'll be sending you in your inbox of all the resources and the upcoming events around Fixed and um, all the other links that we showed during this, this event. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.